Yep. Okay. So we're very happy to have Alex Wolinski here um, for his presentation on cooperation in large populations with incomplete information. Alex, you have 90 minutes. The participant can ask questions through Q&A and I'm going to be keeping an eye on them and interrupting Alex if uh, uh, something arises. Uh, thank you very much in advance, Alex. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you. That's great. Thanks very much. Thanks for uh, inviting me to give this talk. Happy to be uh, presenting this to this audience. Um, again, as, as Arda said, please don't hesitate to jump in with questions. I, I'm hoping that there be more discussion and less of me just talking to my computer screen for 90 minutes. So yeah, that would be great. Um, okay, so uh, this talk is uh, based on work joint with uh, my uh, long-term co-author, uh, Tuguo Sugai at Stanford USB. And uh, we're interested in modeling uh, cooperation in large populations with uh, incomplete information, in particular when there's some uh, possibly small chance that some agents in society uh, might not play cooperatively, rationally, in equilibrium, uh, uh, what have you, and asking uh, when does that or does it not uh, hinder the possibility of cooperation in the larger. So just let me start with a very uh, overview briefly. So this is a paper about Repeated games. Repeated games, of course, are economists' main tool for modeling long-run relationships. Uh, they've been used to study a range of economic problems, uh, famously uh, modeling collusion among firms, relational contracts within and between organizations, risk sharing, informal credit and exchange in the absence of formal contractual enforcement, and community management of public resources, among others. Uh, so all of these settings involve long run relationships, uh, but they also differ from each other in, in very important ways that I, I think haven't always been fully recognized. For example, collusion in a small oligopoly or a relational contract between a single worker or a small team and a manager involve a relatively small number of, uh, we might think, relatively sophisticated players. And these settings seem well captured by standard repeated game models with a small number of players, uh, all of whom are rational, and uh, centralized sorts of information about players' actions, so-called uh, public models. Uh, on the other hand, some of these other applications of repeated games in economics, such as conventions governing risk sharing, exchange, or resource management, often cover large groups in which it may be implausible that everyone in the group is rational and plays equilibrium. And moreover, monitoring uh, in these situations could be uh, radically decentralized. Give a situation where, uh, say, uh, players um, match or interact with the subset of the population each period. Maybe you observe your partner's behaviors very well, but you have very little information about what's going on in the rest of the group. The branch of repeated games geared towards understanding these settings is often called community enforcement. That's going to be the subject of today's talk. Just to provide a little background on these kind of models, early work in community enforcement, and I have in mind here uh, seminal papers by uh, Misha Kandori, Glenn Ellison, and others, show that large groups can often support cooperation even with extremely little information about each other, about the behavior of other members of the group uh, by relying on, well, specifically in these papers, what they call contagion strategy, which are a form of collective punishment. If anyone misbehaves, not only is that player punished, but uh, things go worse for everyone in the group. So to fix ideas and to briefly review uh, their results, uh, think about the prisoner's dilemma with anonymous random matching. That means that we have a finite population of agents. Each period, the players randomly match in pairs to play the standard, uh, standard two-player prisoner's dilemma. And at the end of each period, uh, players observe only their partner's action. So right in this game, I, 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 each period I wake up, I, I, I meet with someone I don't recognize, then players are anonymous, I decide, do I cooperate or defect, and I see what my partner played against me. Now, contagion strategies are nothing but grim trigger strategies in this context. Each player individually follows a strategy of starting out cooperating and switching to defecting forever if you ever play or observe defecting. We can see that under these strategies, the threat of collective punishment incentivizes cooperation, even though deviators can't be identified. Right? So when, whenever you use contagion strategies, uh, it could be in your interest to cooperate because if you defect, uh, then your partner's going to switch to defecting, and her partner's going to switch to defecting, and so on and so forth. Defecting is going to spread like a contagion throughout the population, and you're eventually going to be hurt. So even though 
uh, you're, you're anonymous, nobody knows that you're the one who messed up cooperation with the group. By defecting, you, you mess up cooperation, and that's going to come back to hurt you. So it could be an interesting one. And of course, verifying whether such strategies actually form a sequential equilibrium can be delicate. That's the subject of Kendra Allison's paper, uh, not so related to today's talk. Let me also mention that beyond uh, contagion strategies in the prisoner's dilemma, a recent paper with Taku and, and Joey Deb at, at, at Yale, uh, generalized these kind of collective punishments to uh, prove the, folk, the full folk theorem for repeated games with anonymous random matching. So not so, uh, in other words, in repeated games with anonymous random matching, not only players cooperate the prisoner's dilemma, but we, we can have a, a general folk theorem. Okay. Crucially though, contagion strategies and uh, essentially all existing prior results on uh, anonymous random matching games, like the paper with, uh, the previous paper with Tuku and Joey, require that everyone is rational. If there's even one bad apple in the population who always defects, that messes up these strategies. Now, naturally, in a large population, not everyone is going to be rational. It's one thing to assume that in a bilateral relationship, everyone's rational. It's another to assume that in a a uh, large trading coalition or a large community managing some resource stocks that, that everyone's rational. That seems like quite a strong assumption. So if we really want to understand what kinds of information large groups need to support cooperation, we have to consider community enforcement with some bad apples and other, other types of agents who may be uh, irrationally committed to, to run into different strategies. And this is in some sense a well-known problem uh, in fact, Ellison already noted this uh, problem quite forcefully in his original paper, uh, but although he, he didn't address it, and, and very little progress on this issue has been made uh, since. So today's talk is going to address this issue. We're going to, and in particular, I'll present three results on community enforcement with incomplete information. Okay, so the first result is going to concern anonymous random matching. Uh, uh, when applied to the prison dilemma, this is going to refer to exactly the same uh, model studied by Kendori and Ellison, although as we'll see, this is going to extend to a, a much broader class of anonymous repeated games. And here we derive quite a stark uh, anti-folk theorem, uh, quite a stark uh, negative result for the prospects of cooperation when there are some bad apples in a large anonymous group. So specifically, we, we show the following. Say, fix any positive probability epsilon that each player is a bad apple who always plays selfishly, defects in the prison's dilemma. Uh, take any sequence of games indexed by the population size and the discount factor where the group size grows large. And in particular, players could be uh, very patient here. So it could be that while the group's getting large, players are getting patient much faster than the group's getting large. And in fact, we could even consider the undiscounted case. Uh, so we show that along any such sequence, um, so in other words, we, we fix the commitment probability epsilon, we fix the payoff parameters of the game, we take n large, uh, payoffs are going to converge to the uh, mutual defection effect. So cooperation is going to break down. Uh, in other words, we get a completely different result than the positive results of Kandori Ellison and others when epsilon equals zero, uh, hence this slogan, a few bad apples spoil the barrel. You fix any small chance of bad types, uh, that destroys these previous positive. And as I said, this result's not only about the prisoner's dilemma, it extends to many uh, symmetric anonymous repeated games. There could be other commitment types in addition to this selfish type that always defects. And similar ideas also apply to mechanism design. Uh, for example, we'll also obtain a new variant of uh, mailers and postulates and possibility result for large population public good position. In particular, uh, these results don't require that types are uh, exactly independent. We've got some correlation among types, and so we'll be able to prove a relative version of the male post weight theorem that allows for some correlation. Okay, so this is a, quite a, a negative result. On the other hand, it is said in this very informationally poor setting of anonymous random matching. So we then ask what happens uh, under non-anonymous random matching, which is likely the more realistic case in many settings. Now when players match, uh, they observe each other's identity uh, in, a, uh, in addition to their action at the end. Sorry, I said that a little bit uh, imprecisely. When we match, we observe each other's identities, then we take actions and we see what the other one did. 
Okay, so if you think about this for a minute, it's clear that this Stark anti-folk theorem I claimed we're going to establish for the anonymous case cannot extend to the non-anonymous case. Why is that? Well, uh, if players' are, identities are observable, and if each pair of players interacts frequently, we could just forget about community enforcement and instead view this overall repeated random matching game as just a collection of two-player repeated games. And we can just support cooperation in each of these bilateral games by a standard R. So in other words, with, with observable identities, if each pair of players interacts frequently, uh, there's no problem with supporting cooperation here. But that's kind of not a very interesting observation. That, that, that situation is, is not really community enforced. And moreover, it's also a quite an extreme assumption that in, even in a large population, each pair interacts frequently enough to support cooperation. So the more interesting case, the one that we focus on, is when each player interacts with someone frequently, but each pair of players interacts with each other infrequently. Okay, so you interact, you interact with someone frequently, but if the population's large, so you know, for any given other player, you only interact with them on average, uh, not very often. Too infrequently to support cooperation via only bilateral incentives. And in the case, we again get a very stark negative result. We again show that payoffs in any Nash equilibrium converge to the mutual defection. Uh, this result we think is, is kind of interesting. The proof combines ideas from repeated games and from information theory. And we'll see that this result actually extends if players have access to any additional information source where the number of realizations uh, of, of this uh, additional signal is bounded independently of the group size. So for example, this result would extend if for any fixed number k, uh, when, when we meet, I observe your last k action. So, this, so that result implies that to support cooperation in large groups, even with observed identities, uh, the information available to players has to increase with the size of the group. Uh, so at first that may seem like a demanding assumption, but our, our third and final result is going to show that actually uh, quite a simple form of information suffices, uh, which is uh, simply gossip about third parties' reputation. So specifically, we show that if uh, we allow uh, cheap talk communication between match partners without uh, a priori bounding the cardinality of the message set, so in other words, now, now the models we match, we observe those entities, now we just exchange ordinary cheap talk messages and then we take action. So in that model, we see that we can support a uh, folk theorem under very general conditions. Now, there's a little parenthetical here. Of course, if the population is, is so massively large that you know, I ne not only do I not meet any other player uh, very frequently, but uh, you know, it's very unlikely that I'll even meet anyone who met anyone who met anyone who met me in the last million years, you know, then of course any, any kind of within match communication won't be enough to support cooperation. But we exclude that case of uh, you know, truly enormous populations, so in particular if uh, one minus discount factor times log n is small, uh, we get a folk theorem. And the basic idea here is simply that when players meet, they can uh, share with each other a blacklist uh, of uh, third parties who, who shouldn't be trusted. Um, and, and that way, if I cheat anybody, then you know, if, if, if I cheat, cheat Arda today, then tomorrow is going to tell his friends, uh, by the way, in the future, don't trust Alex, and they'll tell their friends that, and so on. And, and very quickly, you know, I'll, I'll be distrusted, and, uh, and that will be bad for me. Uh, although note that since, since identities are observed, your cooperation won't necessarily break down the whole community. Right? Everyone will, you all can keep cooperating with each other while, while telling each other not to trust me next time you meet. So putting our results together, we show that observable identities and gossip are essential for cooperation in our model. Uh, and we think as they're essential for cooperation in many real world groups, but unlike uh, uh, in prior community enforcement models where cooperation is, is supported with the threat of collective punishment and very little information. So we think this, taken together, this set of results gives a more realistic picture of how we can support cooperation in large groups, namely via uh, communication and individualized punishments rather than uh, blind collective punishments in the absence. Can I ask a question, Alex? About, of course. I mean, of course, what, uh, so one thing that I'm wondering is 
with this no bound on cardinality on the message space is like a stringent assumption. Do you know how large the cardinality has to be for these results? To yeah, work? so essentially, essentially what you need is to be able to uh, convey, essentially what you need is to, is to convey a binary report of each other player's standing. So mm -hmm. for blacklist is enough. I need to say, uh, okay, uh, here's the set of people who I think are bad guys you shouldn't cooperate with. And that's, a, that's essentially the information you need. So essentially you need a, I need to tell you, you know, what, the, what the set of people is in the population who, who you shouldn't cooperate with. Okay. And so you, yes, like uh, in some sense, that's a lot of, that's potentially a lot of information, but um, you know, we think it's quite natural and we show that with less information, you're uh, essentially gonna be sound. Because again, like our, our theme here is that collective enforcement doesn't work, right? You know, previous models where everyone's rational, you know, collective punishment could, could work. If, every, if everyone's gonna, if everyone's gonna behave well, then we, we can find something to say, well, if anyone behaves badly, uh, then, then things are gonna break down. Once we allow that in a large population, inevitably there's gonna be some fraction of people who don't behave well, uh, collective punishment's not gonna work anymore. We need to keep track of individual risk. Any other questions? So this is the end of the introduction. So the, the plan is just to go through these three results in turn, the uh, anti theorem for anonymous repeated games, and then consider observable identities. First, we have this negative result in the absence of communication, and then a uh, positive with communication. Sorry, Emin, do you have a question? So Alex, uh, just, to, uh, just as a clarifying question. So let's say I, we are at period T. So my blacklist will be will consist of all the guys in the the, the first t minus period t minus one period who were bad guys. Is it? Um. So we'll we'll see we'll see some more details uh, as we come. So the answer we give you is um, going to be slightly imprecise in some sense, but uh, essentially the, the basic idea is that. Uh, in equilibrium, the good types are going to cooperate and the bad types are going to defect. So my blacklist is going to consist of the bad types who I met by period T and the bad types who my partners met by period T because they told me about them and the bad types who my partner's partners met by period T and so on. Okay. And uh, I was wondering whether your result is tight in that any limited memory about the bad types in the past uh, breaks down the result? Um, let, let's let me talk about that a little bit later. Okay. I'm okay. Sure exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other questions before we get into it? Okay. Okay. So this first uh, negative result I'm going to present is uh, a, a general uh, impossibility result for cooperation in large anonymous repeated games. It's not specific to the random matching prisoner dilemma. So uh, in particular, we can consider any symmetric n player stage game where players have an action set A and payoff functions U. We assume payoffs are uh, bounded and we'll normalize the range of payoffs to lie in the unit interval. And uh, the key assumption here is that players are anonymous. So what that means is that a player's payoff depends only on her own action and the number of players taking each other at, each other at not their identity. So an example would be a repeated game with uh, anonymous matching where uh, you know, I just care how many people are playing and cooperating today, not which ones. The game's played repeatedly in discrete time and the uh, monitoring what players observe about others' uh, past actions and information can be completely arbitrary here. So uh, at the start of each period, each player gets some signal that can depend on the history of past actions and signals but it doesn't matter for purposes of this result uh, what that signal is like. We can have perfect monitoring, we can have public monitoring, private monitoring, that's not going to be important for this result. Let me also note that the assumptions of symmetry and anonymity are unrelated to the dimensionality of the uh, feasible directional payoff set, which is something that we know is important for folk theorems with complete information. For example, the prisoner's dilemma with anonymous random matching has a full dimensional 
uh, feasibly an injectional payoff set. If you think about the action vectors where player I cooperates and everyone else defects, as we vary I, we trace out a, a full dimensional set of payoff vectors. Okay, now we're introducing incomplete information, so each player I is going to have a type. And for simplicity, let's assume there are only two types. This could be uh, easily generalized, but for simplicity, there are two types, types R and B. R is rational. A rational player here maximizes her expected discounted payoff with some discount factor delta. It could be zero, so we could have a static gain here. B is a bad type. Uh, bad type here is someone who uh, is committed to always playing some particular action A star. For instance, in the prison dilemma, A star could be defect, the bad type could be someone who just relentlessly defects. There's a prior P on the set of players' types, RB to the N. We'll assume that this prior P is symmetric, uh, so again, there's no asymmetries among the players coming through the prior, uh, but not necessarily independent, so there, there could be correlation in, uh, in different players' types. Let's let epsilon be the probability that a, a given player is bad, the same for all players. Special case here, players are bad with independent probability epsilon, but we're not assuming independent. Given a strategy profile sigma, let's denote a given player i's expected payoff conditional on type profile theta by ui of theta. Now note that uh, theta i here could be b, uh, so implicitly we're, we're assuming here that Rational and bad types have the same payoff functions. So the interpretation of the bad types is that they're constrained to always take action. Alternatively, we could be more uh, um, agnostic about the payoffs of bad types and instead consider payoffs just conditional and types being rational, so small difference. Let's also note playerized ex ante expected payoff by UI. That's the expectation over the type profiles of UI of theta. Now, uh, the negative result, the anti folk theorem I'm going to show you, is going to concern the set of equilibrium values of per capita utilitarian social wealth. Now, as far as that set is concerned, it's without loss to restrict attention to symmetric strategies, because otherwise we could allow public randomization, which could only help us, and use that to randomly permute the player strategies before playing the game. So in terms of deriving a negative result for the possibility of attaining a high level of utilitarian welfare, it's going to be without loss here to consider symmetric strategies. Any questions with the setup or the kind of games I'm considering? Okay, so our first result is going to give conditions, uh, our anti folk result is going to give conditions under which uh, population payoffs are close to those when everyone takes the bad action the bad type action A star. So, right, fraction F, you know, each player with probably epsilon is, uh, has to take action A star when you have conditions in which in equilibrium, everyone takes A star. We'll proceed in two steps. So first, we're gonna give conditions on the prior under which a rational type expected payoff can't be too much less than a bad type's expected payoff against the same population distribution of action. So in, in other words, these are uh, uh, conditions under which a, 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 a rational type by playing your equilibrium strategy uh, can't do much less than she would by playing the bad type strategy against the same opposing action distribution. Uh, now, if you think about it, if, if a rational player uh, does follow uh, a, the bad type strategy, that does, does play the strategy played by bad types, then her strategy is, then, then her payoff's gonna be exactly what it would be uh, if you were actually a bad type, and there were one more total bad type. So this condition is going to hold if for each number n, the probability that there are n bad types is close to the probability that there are n plus one bad types. Right? If, if increasing the number of bad types by one doesn't have a big effect in everyone's payoffs, uh, so, sorry, does, does, sorry if, let, let, let me take that back. Um, if the probability that there are n bad types and n plus one bad types are similar, then a irrational player who follows the bad type strategy is going to similar payoff to that of the bad type strategy. And this is going to hold, for example, with independent types, if we fix the bad type probability epsilon and take n to infinity. I 
And next, we have conditions on the game, the pass of the game, under which this bound implies that almost everyone has to take the bad type action. And roughly, that's going to hold if the bad type action is dominant in the state. Because in this case, the only way that the rational type uh, can approach the bad type's payoff against the same action distribution is the rational type almost always takes the same action as the bad type. So for example, uh, if we consider the prisoner's dilemma, bad types are committed to always defecting, fix the commitment probability epsilon, take the population large, chaos have to approach the mutual defect. Okay, so let's, let, let's consider what these conditions are going to have to be. Okay, so first we need a little notation. So conditional on the, the event that a given player i is rational, Let's let Qn be the probability that n out of the remaining n minus 1 players are bad. So from a rational player's perspective, Q sub n is the probability that there are n bad players in the population. Conditional on the same event, let Qn minus be the probability that there are n minus 1 bad players in the population. Preview, why does that matter? Well, because um, if there are truly n minus 1 bad players in the population, I as a rational type deviate and take the bad type action myself, it's going to look, the, the population distribution of actions is going to be as if they were n bad. So that's why this qn minus is going to matter. Okay, now if you look at these uh, variables qn and qn minus, qn naturally could be anything between 0 and n minus 1. Uh, qn minus could uh, naturally, um, sorry, sorry, let me say that a little bit better. Uh, Qn can naturally be a, a positive number for n between 0 and n minus 1. Qn minus could be a positive number for n between 1 and n. Let's uh, just normalize Q sub n and Q minus sub naught to 0 so that both Q and Q minus are well-defined probability distributions of the set of numbers between 0 and n. And then let's consider the total variation distance between these two distributions, delta Q, Q minus. It's the sum over numbers n of the uh, difference in probability uh, in the probability that there are n bed types and n minus one bed types. Okay, so again, from the perspective of a rational player, QN is the probability that uh, n players in the population uh, take the bad type strategy, always A star, when she herself follows her equilibrium strategy, different from always A star. Qn minus is the probability that n players in the population always play A star when she herself deviates and always plays A star as well. So therefore, the difference between these two distributions, uh, delta Q, Q minus, is a measure of the detectability of a deviation by a rational player to the strategy always A star. Right? If, if I, as a rational player, instead of following my strategy, follow the bad type strategy, uh, how much does that deviation affect the distribution of the number of players in the population taking this action that's measured by this delta Q Q minus? Okay, and here's a uh, useful lemma. So uh, what it says is that a rational player's uh, expected payoff uh, can't be too much less than uh, the payoff that she would get against that same population of opposing actions is she took the bad type action, where uh, how much less it could be is, is measured by this uh, distance between these probability distributions, delta Q, Q minus. But specifically, let's fix any Nash equilibrium for any number n, conditional on uh, there being n bad types, let u and r be the expected payoff of a rational type, and let u and b be the expected payoff of a bad type. And the lemma says that for any anonymous game in any symmetric Nash equilibrium, uh, a rational player's expected payoff uh, has to, uh, can't be more than delta QQ minus less than uh, the payoff she would get against that same action distribution if she always took the bad type back. And uh, intuitively, this follows because uh, in a Nash equilibrium, a rational type has to prefer her own strategy to the bad type strategy. Uh, if she deviates to the bad type strategy and the true number of bad types is n, her payoff is the same as it would be if she were truly a bad type and there were n plus 1 bad types. Um, so therefore, the, the rational player payoff has to be uh, better than 
uh, the bad type payoff when we shift up by one the number of bad types, and that's captured by this delta key. Any questions about this notation or kind of what this is asserting? No. Okay, now when is this found significant? Well, it's going to be significant when this delta QQ minus is a small number. When you know the difference between the probability of their n bad types and n plus one bad types is small. When that's true in a large population we'll say that the distribution of the number of bad types is smooth. So in particular, if we fix a sequence uh, n uh, of, of no, the number of players n and the prior p, where we take the number of players in the population large, we'll say the distribution of the number of bad types is smooth if this delta qq minus goes to zero. So when is that true? So if the distribution of the number of bad types is like in case, uh, this holds if the probability that the number of bad, if the probability that the number of bad types takes in any particular value n goes to zero as big n goes to infinity. So, right, if for every number uh, you give me, say, seven, the probability that there are exactly seven bad guys in the population goes to zero as the population gets very large. So, for example, that's true if types are independent and we fix any. Uh, commitment probability epsilon and take n to infinity. Then, right, the distribution number of bad types is going to approach a normal distribution. Uh, the probability with, um, so the, the probability that uh, n takes any particular value is going to go to zero, like uh, one by square root n. So in other words, this I'm claiming that this condition, this smoothness condition is, is quite a uh, mild condition. On the other hand, you can also think of cases where it's violated. So, for example, suppose that we knew in advance that there were an even number of bad types in the population. Well, then this delta QQ minus would be one, uh, so the lower bound would be vacuous. And two, if we knew in advance that there was, had to be an even number of bad types, then if a rational player uh, followed the strategy of a bad type, that would be detectable, right? If, if, we, if we know in advance that there has to be some even number of players who are always defecting, if we notice that there's an odd number, that tells us something's gone wrong and, and we could potentially disincentivize that deviation with some large collection. But that's of course a, a rather artificial case. And, and I claim that uh, in, in most reasonable settings, we, we would expect this with this condition to be satisfied. Alex? Yeah. So I assume maybe another sort of extreme case where this assumption holds is that suppose that we actually know the number of bad types, but we don't know the number of players. Um, so there is like a Poisson distribution of N. Um, do you have an idea about whether that's going to extend to that case? Um, Yeah, that's a good question. I need to uh, I need to think about that a little bit. Um, okay. No, it's not. I'm hesitating. It's it's not totally obvious how uh, how we would model uncertainty about the number of players here. So I need I need. No, to I, mean, I guess you can model the uncertainty about the number of players. Of course, it doesn't make sense if you in advance know how many bad types are there. But I'm just trying to trace another corner case. That's all. I'm yeah yeah thanks let, let me think about that yeah, yeah sure sure okay okay so our first main result is that uh this lower bound on the path of a rational player that we derived implies an anti-folk theorem uh if the commitment action taken by the bad types is what we call pairwise dominant so pairwise dominant is similar to being a dominant strategy in the stage game, but it's uh, slightly different. So specifically, we say that an action in the stage game is pairwise dominant if there exists some uh, positive constant C, such that if some player takes the pairwise dominant action A star and another player takes a different action, then no matter what the remaining players do, the player who took A star does better than the player who didn't take A star by at least C. 
So in particular, a strictly dominant action is also pairwise dominant if it imposes a negative externality on the other player. And that switching my own action from A star to A uh, would always help uh, another player taking it. And moreover, a non-dominant action can be pairwise dominant only if it imposes a sufficiently large negative externality. So this is uh, similar to an action being dominant, but you know, dominant refers only to your own payoff. It says you, know, you always do better to take a dominant action than take anything else. Pairwise dominant is more about how you do relative to other players. If you take a pairwise dominant action and someone else doesn't, you have to do better than she. For example, defect is pairwise dominant in the prisoner's dilemma. It's strictly dominant and it imposes a negative action. And here's the first result of today's talk. Uh, fix any game with a pairwise dominant action A star. Let's let U star be the resulting payoff whenever the population takes A star. And let's let B be the greatest impact on social welfare that can result from a player switching her own action from A star to some other action. So B is the greatest benefit I could provide to others by taking some uh, selfless action rather than the selfish action to The results the following. So here, no, so here the, the first part of this result is going to apply for any uh, anonymous game with the pairwise dominant action. So particularly it doesn't involve taking any kind of limit. And then the second part of the result is going to say what happens uh, when we take a sequence of such games, the population size gets larger. The first part says that for any anonymous repeated game with a pairwise dominant action, in any Nash equilibrium, uh, utilitarian social welfare U uh, can only differ from U star uh, welfare when everyone takes the pairwise dominant action by so much. And so much is a constant times uh, delta QQ minus, the difference in the distribution of the number of bad types when everyone plays equilibrium versus when one rational type deviates and uh, pretends to be a bad type, follows the strategy of that. And we can immediately see from that that if we take a sequence of anonymous repeated games indexed by the population size with a pairwise dominant action, such that uh, C, the uh, advantage of taking a pairwise dominant action, doesn't vanish, it then goes to infinity, and B, the uh, benefit of uh, taking a selfless action to everyone else doesn't blow up, and we have a smooth distribution of bad types so that delta QQ minus goes to zero, then for any corresponding sequence of uh, social welfare levels arising in equilibrium, uh, these welfare levels have to converge to that when everyone takes A star. So for instance, in the prisoner's dilemma with anonymous random matching, this would say that uh, welfare has to converge to the mutual defection. Any questions about this? About what it's saying? So why is, it, why is it true? Well, by the lower bound I just showed, uh, band types payoffs cannot exceed rational types payoffs against a fixed action distribution by more than delta QQ minus. But in essence, A star is pairwise dominant, which means that if I take A star and you take something else, I always do uh, better than you by C. That means that band types payoffs uh, are going to exceed rational types payoffs by at least this C times the fraction of the time that rational players take anything other than A star. Now, of course, if you have a discounted repeated game, it's not the you know, undiscounted fraction of time that matters, but the uh, discounted fraction of time, uh, that's sometimes known in repeated games, is the uh, occupation measure. So the discounted expected fraction of time that rational players take anything other than A star. Each time they do that, they lose C relative to the bad types. So bad types pass, you're gonna exceed rational types pass by at least C times its occupation measure. So therefore, this occupation measure has to be less than this distance delta QQ minus times some constant. And so when the distance is small, both bad types and rational types have to almost always take the bad type action. So in, intuitively, um, if whenever a uh, rational type takes uh, a star, she gets a very similar payoff to what the bad types are getting against the same action distribution. You know, if it's switching one more type's behavior from rational to bad doesn't have a big effect on the overall action distribution, then when bad types' actions are always uh, doing better than rational types' actions, 
you know, rational types are going to be losing out to the bad types unless they're almost always taking the bad type back. That's what they have to be doing. Another way to think about this result is that, um, you know, when players are anonymous, cooperative behavior is like a kind of public good. Right? Cooperation benefits everybody. So for me to be incentivized to cooperate myself, it has to be that if I don't cooperate, that causes a significant decrease in the aggregate level of cooperation. But in a large population where there's significant uncertainty about how many types are going to be uh, uh, are going to be cooperating, you know, it's just not possible that each time some additional player starts uh, defecting, that has some significant that causes a significant reduction in the aggregate level of cooperation. Um, any questions about this? Okay, so let me briefly mention a couple of related results with a similar logic. So, so this anti that we just showed applies only to games with a pairwise dominant action. Uh, but similar arguments are going to yield a, a similar negative result in other uh, games and mechanisms of time problems. For example, we show in the paper how to extend this kind of result to uh, uh, games without a dominant action. And we can show, uh, for example, that in linear demand chrono oligopoly, if uh, the bad types are committed to take the static, uh, produce a static Nash quantity, then collusion is impossible in a large oligopoly. Industry profits go to zero as n goes to infinity, even if the firms are extremely patient. Uh, another, we think, interesting variant uh, concerns uh, static mechanism design. So let's consider a static uh, n player binary public good provision problem. So we have n players who jointly decide whether they produce a public good or not. With a discrete type space, your player's type is for value for the public good. A symmetric prior, everything I've told you so far relies on symmetry, and bounded transfers. So let's now let the vector n count the number of players who, who report as having each possible value for the good. So n is how many people say that they don't value the good at all, how many people say they value it a little bit, and, and so on. And uh, given two types theta and theta prime, let delta q theta q theta theta prime denote the total variation distance between the distributions on n, the count of the number of players with each type, uh, according to a type theta player, when she reports truthfully, that's q theta, and when she misreports as type theta prime, that's q theta theta. So then if this uh, delta q theta q theta theta prime goes to zero for all types theta and theta prime, for example, if types are independent or conditionally independent, and we take n to infinity while fixing the type distribution, then the probability of providing a public good with per capita cost bounded above the uh, lowest possible value for the good, uh, as which is what Miller's most way consider also, uh, goes to zero as n goes to infinity. So, uh, in other words, if, if, the, if, if changing one player's uh, report doesn't have a large effect in the aggregate distribution of the number of players who report as having each type, it's impossible to provide a uh, public good that we don't ex ante know is uh, efficient, that we d we're not sure that it's efficient ex ante to provide. And so as we know, this is the first version of the Miller post way theorem that allows correlation in types. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it requires symmetry, which, which isn't required for the classical version of independent. So, different version of Miller. And again, the, the logic here, though, is, is very clean. It's sort of the same as what I, I just said. Um, you know, we're deciding whether to provide a public good or not. If I'm going to fess up that uh, I actually value this public good and think we should provide it, and, and say I'm willing to pay for it, it had better be true that if I said I don't like this public good at all, the odds it get pro gets provided go down significantly. And in a large population with some variability about the number of players uh, who are going to have each type, you know, it's just not possible that each time some player says she doesn't want to provide the public good, that there's a significant decrease in the odds it's good. Okay. Alex? Uh, yeah? So are you going to sort of comment on this discontinuity at zero as a, I think I, um, 
like thinking at the Ellison Ellison paper as the benchmark. Yeah, well, so 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 you can think about it. So that's a case where you can define. That's a case where this delta would always be one, right? You know, the effect. Yes. If we know that there are zero bad types, and if one guy starts defecting, that's made a huge aggregate impact on the. Uh, I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're right. Okay. Okay. So. The anonymous case we've been discussing so far is an important but extreme benchmark. We think it's usually more realistic to assume that uh, players can recognize their opponents and can direct rewards or punishments towards specific individuals. In anonymous games, we've been doing so far, cooperation is a public good, and so incentives can be provided only uh, collectively. Whereas with observed identities, you're cooperating with you is a private good, so individualized incentives are used. So, now let's turn to this case of observed identities and, and see what happens there. Okay, so we're going to now specialize the model a bit. We're now going to restrict attention to the prisoner's dilemma with non-anonymous random matching, so observed identities. And we're also going to assume that types are independent. So a, a bit more specialized setting now. So in particular, we have n players. Each period, they randomly match in pairs, uniformly, in, uh, uniformly random and independently across periods to play the standard prisoner's dilemma. Here, uh, we've normalized the mutual defection payoff to one, the mutual cooperation payoff, sorry, the mutual defection payoff to zero, the mutual cooperation payoff to one. G is how much I gain by cheating you, L is how much I lose when D is strictly dominant, mutual cooperation is equal. Again, let's consider the simple setting for now with uh, just two types. Players are rational, it's probably one minus epsilon and bad with probability epsilon independently across players, bad types always get better. In each period, players match, you observe uh, your partner's identity, you decide whether to cooperate or defect, and then you observe your partner's action. Rational types again maximize expected discount. Okay, we're gonna consider sequences of repeated games where the population size and the discount factor vary together well, we fix the payoff parameters G and L and the commitment probability F. This exercise has a very standard interpretation in terms of varying the interaction frequency in the group. Specifically, if we fix a real-time discount rate R and suppose that players match every delta units of time, del every delta units of real time, then the discount factor delta is just uh, e to the minus R cap delta. We're going to focus on the limit where each player interacts with someone else frequently, so that capital delta goes to zero, or equivalently, the discount factor little delta goes to one. But this assumption that players interact with someone else frequently is consistent with either the case where each pair of players interacts frequently with each other frequently, or each pair of players interacts only infrequently. And that distinction is going to make a big difference for us. So in particular, note that on average, each pair of players interacts uh, one over delta times n minus one times per unit of real time. Or you interact with someone one over delta times, you interact with any particular other player one over delta times n minus one. And when uh, uh, capital delta is close to zero, this is approximately uh, r divided by one minus significant factor times n. So we see that each, a given pair of players can interact with each other frequently, that corresponds to saying that uh, one minus delta times n goes to zero. Whereas a given pair of players interactions are only infrequently if one minus delta times n goes to infinity. So we're always going to assume the discount vector delta goes to one. That's equivalent. That, that says that each player interacts with someone frequently. Uh, the case where pairs interact with each other frequently is the case where not only does delta go to one, but one minus, but delta goes to one faster than n goes to infinity. The case where pairs of players interact with each other infrequently is when delta goes to one slower than n goes. And we're going to see if this difference really matters. Any, any questions about this? And in particular, if pairs of players interact with each other frequently, uh, it's easy to prove a folk theorem regardless of the commitment probability epsilon. And uh, I already gave the basic idea. We can simply view the repeated game as a collection of distinct two-player repeated games and just use Nash reversion in each of these two-player games. 
even if I think you're quite likely to be a bad guy, it's worth trying to cooperate if we're uh, patient enough and, and meet each other frequently. So completely standard argument here that we can support uh, in each uh, two-player game any feasible and directional payoff. And so, you know, we, we could choose any profile of such payoffs across pairs of players and support it as an equity. In a society that we may be able to support more payoffs than this with more sophisticated strategies, for example, player one might be willing to settle for less than her min-max payoff in her relationship with player two, and she's compensated for this by getting more than her min-max payoff in her relationship with player three. But that issue is kind of orthogonal to the point we're making here, so we're just gonna leave that aside. And Kintetra still was saying that if pairs indirect frequently, it's easy to support cooperation. Uh, another, immediate observation is that if 1 minus delta log n goes to infinity, then mutual defection is going to be the only Nash equilibrium, even if uh, matched pairs of players uh, can exchange information arbitrarily. Because if 1 minus delta log n goes to infinity, you don't need anyone who met anyone who ever met you within a pair of relevant time. So the interesting case here is, is then uh, when pairs of players interact infrequently, so that 1 minus delta n goes to infinity, or at least doesn't go to zero, but not so infrequent that community enforcement is completely hopeless. And that one minus, so, so we're going to assume that one minus delta log n goes to zero or at least doesn't go to it. So, in contrast to the simple result that cooperation is possible with pairs and direct frequently, we have a, a stark negative result in the case where pairs and direct infrequently. It says that if pairs and direct infrequently, pairs converge to mutual defection. In other words, for any, so in other words, let's fix the community probability epsilon, fix the stage game parameters. Then for any sequence n in delta, where 1 minus delta n goes to infinity, so n goes to infinity faster than delta goes to 1, and any corresponding sequence of Nash equilibrium payoffs, payoffs go to mutual defection. So, in other words, just to summarize what I've claimed so far, we said that when pairs of players interact frequently, community enforcement is not necessary. We can support cooperation only with bilateral incentives. And the theorem says that when pairs interact infrequently, community enforcement doesn't work. So putting this together, it says that without adding some type of communication or information sharing to the model, which we're ultimately going to do, community enforcement is not effective. Any questions about what these results are claiming? Okay, let me give an intuition for this theorem. Okay, so we've, we already proved an anti folk theorem for anonymous games. We, we already know that if players don't observe each other's entities, they can't support cooperation. Of course, the same result's going to hold if players do observe each other's identities but don't condition on that information. So the only hope for supporting cooperation is going to be uh, that players use individualized incentives. They uh, condition their play uh, against their opponents on their identities. And so we have to, our only hope is to offer individualized incentives, in other words, to somehow monitor the behavior of each of these end players. So can we do that? Well, note that uh, matching here is random. So, so seeing uh, who I matched with doesn't tell me anything about how people have behaved. But in terms of monitoring players, I observe exactly one useful bit of information each period, which is my opponent's action. Where my opponent either cooperates or defects, that, that's, all, that, that's, all, that's all I'm learning about actions in the population. Now, um, now, in order to monitor uh, n players' actions with uh, any non-vanishing precision as n grows, we show that this requires order of n bits of information. So this is a key information theory that's result that's at the heart of this theorem. There's just no way to individually monitor each of n players' actions if I have much fewer than n bits of information. And since I get one bit per period, it takes order of n periods to get enough information to get a good sense of what each player is doing. But now, when pairs of players interact infrequently, 
so that one minus delta n is large, rewards or punishments that are delivered order of n periods in the future are not sufficient to motivate cooperation. Right? In this case, play the, you know, players are, even though delta is going to one, it, relative to n, players are, are too impatient to be willing to wait n periods to gather so much information to know exactly who's cooperating to affect. So uh, basically, there's, there's no way, well, the idea of the thing is there's, when pairs of players are frequently, there's no way to get enough information to monitor players' individual reputations in a pair of relevant time. And so all that will be left will be collective punishment and collective punishment doesn't. Okay, that's very high level. Uh, to try to give a little more explanation of what's going on, let me start with this information theory result that's at the core of this theory. Okay, and here it is, and, and, and here I've written this in purely probabilistic language. This is just a probability level. What does it say? Uh, let's let x1 through xn be IID binary random variables, each taking on value 1 with probability f. So, of course, in the game, these uh, xi is going to be player i's type, rational or bad. But here, these are just binary random variables. And let s be a k-dimensional binary random variable defined in the same probability space. So, the player's types all affect the distribution of this k-dimensional binary signal s. So, s here is some summary of the information we're getting about players. Let epsilon lower bar be the minimum of epsilon and 1 minus epsilon. Then we get the following results. So uh, intuitively what this says is that the, uh, a measure of the total influence of each of the player's types on the signal is bounded by uh, square root of kn over epsilon, where so n is the number of players, the number of signals, k is the dimensionality of uh, the signal, sorry, n is the number of players or the number of you know, binary random variables, the x is, k is the dimensionality of this uh, outcome signal we're observing. This result says that the total influence that players have in the signal is bounded by uh, root k n over f. Now, what exactly do I mean by this total influence? I mean, uh, for each player, let's say that her influence on the signal is the sum of the different sig of, over all the signal realizations of the amount by which uh, the likelihood of that signal uh, increases when her type switches from uh, 0 to 1. And we're now summing this over, uh, over players' i. It's the sum over players of the players, uh, of each player's influence on the signal, has to be bounded by square root k and over f. Uh, and then note in particular, this is that, um, so okay, so uh, another way you say is that the average influence of the player's binary types on a k-dimensional binary variable is at most root k over nf. And note in particular that says that in order for this average influence not to vanish as n grows, k has to grow with n. Right, so if the number of the number of signals we're observing is much smaller than the number of variables we're trying to monitor, uh, we're not going to be able to do it. Alex? Yeah. Is this lemma the reason why you assume that each player's type is IID in this model? Is there an extension? Yes, to... yes, yes. Do you expect there to be a generalization to like a more general setup like you had before? Well, or... yes. So, okay. So, so, so here's the theorem that we prove. If types could be somewhat correlated, then uh, this condition would get somewhat more restrictive. We could state that, but you wouldn't have this interpretation in terms of frequency anymore, right? Mm -hmm. in, in terms of like, so, uh, so you, 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 you could, um, but yeah, but so you could get a, you could get weaker results if you like correlation, but this, this strong result we have here requires. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So let's try to understand what this lemma is, uh, is saying and why we might care about it. So, okay. First of all, uh, the K equals one case. So the case where there's only one signal the player's types are influencing. Uh, what that essentially says is that the, so the lemma in that case essentially says that the average impact of n independent votes on a binary outcome is maximized by majority rule. Uh, let's say that each type, let's say that epsilon's a half here, um, then this would say that 
uh, the uh, signal that maximizes influence is takes value one if, if most players type take value one, takes value zero if most players types take value zero. You know, players average influence on the signal is just for pivot probability, uh, which is approximately one over square root n. So the average influence is about one over square root n. This result is known uh, is, for example, the key result in papers on pivot probabilities in large games and mechanisms by uh, Fiedenberg, Levine, Pessendorfer, and Amantar, and Smordinsky. So given that result, we can easily argue by induction on n that average influence is at most k over root. And that bound is tight if we consider, if we want to get a bound on players' uh, pivot probability. So for example, consider the following uh, signal, which is essentially a, a multi-threshold majority rule. So again, each player here is going to vote yay or nay. The first dimension of the, this k-dimensional signal is going to take value 1, if and only if a majority votes yay. And the second component is going to take value 1, if and only if a majority plus 1 votes yay. And so on and so forth for all k components. So uh, the odds that a given player is pivotal for any one of these components is about a uh, one over root n. So the odds that a player is pivotal in terms of changing the uh, uh, realization, that the pivotal in the sense that a player's vote changes the realization of s is about k over root n. And that bound uh, is also essentially known that's used in recent papers uh, by uh, Awai and Christian. But we need a better bound than that, as we'll see like, k over root n, the Zulema's claiming to actually root, uh, root k over n is, uh, is a bound, and we're, as we'll see, we're going to need the full force of that bound. So what's essential here to notice is that uh, your influence, we've defined it, which is the sum over the signals of the increase in the probability of that signal uh, when your type switches, is not the same as your pivot probability. Pivot probability being the probability that your vote is pivotal for changing the signal. So for example, in this uh, multi-threshold majority rule example, your pivot probability is about k over root n but your influence is actually only about one over root n. Because if you think about it for um, when, you, uh, when you're pivotal and your vote changes uh, some component uh, from zero to one, you, know, you make uh, some signal more likely, but some other signal uh, less likely. So actually the only signals that uh, switching your vote has a uh, significant impact on, on the probability of are the signals where every component is zero and the one where every component is one. And the one that she says that, that root k over n is a bound on influence. So to attain this bound, we could just split the population ex ante into k groups, each of size n over k, and run majority rule on each of them. Right, so you, then you're going to be pivoting your group with probability uh, root k over n. That's going to be the average uh, influence. Uh, but we show that that's actually the uh, uh, optimal influence. There's no way to, um, uh, there's no way to have uh, more more influence than this than just sort of splitting the population into k groups ex ante and using majority rule on each of them. The proof there uses tools for information theory, uh, especially uh, result known as Pinsker's inequality, which is a standard result in information theory. Pinsker's inequality bounds the total variation distance between two probability distributions in terms of the square root of their uh, kolbeck leibler divergence. If you look at our lemma here, you know, we're bounding something like uh, total variation distance in terms of square root of something. So it's uh, not surprising that uh, Pinsker enters the picture. Okay, but you know, I think this results uh, are fairly interesting. So for example, this implies that um, suppose you have a static moral hazard in teams problem and you have some incentive instrument of bounded size. So you can give each player a bounded uh, reward or punishment. If you want to incentivize n players to exert effort, uh, you need order of n signals. Okay. Um, any questions about this lemma? Okay, so let me briefly say we proved the theorem from the lemma. So the idea is once you have this probability lemma, we then can look at the repeated game and view a player's history in period t as an arbitrary t-dimensional signal of her opponent's type. Now, if it's optimal for rational players uh, not to always defect, 
it had better be true that the uh, discounted average over periods t of, uh, of, of, of the opponent's type's average influence on a given player's period t signal has to be small, um, right? Like, um, boy, sorry, did I, maybe. No, sorry, I said something a little bit backwards here, sorry. Uh, uh, other way around. If, if it's optimal for players not to always defect, this influence can't be small. Um, right, so, this inf so to, if players one can always defect, this influence would have to be big. Um, now, we know from the lemma that the average influence is uh, bounded by, so, so in period T, you get a T-dimensional signal. So the average influence of other people's types on your period T signal is bounded by a uh, square root of t over epsilon n. So this uh, discounted average influence uh, is then no more than uh, this quantity here, one over root epsilon n times the discounted sum of square root of t, right, square root of where t here is the, uh, it, it's showing up here as the dimension of the signal that your period t history can convey. Uh, now, this sum is at most uh, 1 minus delta to the minus 3 over 2. So this whole thing is at most 1 over root epsilon n 1 minus delta. So that goes to 0 when players interact in three. Um, okay, so that's all I'm going to say about the proof. You know, let me note actually though that by the same argument, the theorem would extend if players uh, observe additional signals each period, as long as the number of possible signal realizations is bounded uh, independently of n. Uh, right, because um, you know if we just replace this at t here with t times some constant, that wouldn't make any difference. So for example, the result will go through if when you match, if, when I match with you, I, I see not only your name, but I see your last k -act. Or the theme would go through by observe some summary statistic of the fraction of players in the population who cooperate. Um, however, note that if players can freely discuss third parties by name, that then provides additional information with at least two to the n possible realizations. Like say for each other person, this person behaved well, this person behaved badly, that gives uh, um, inference that's exponential in n. And the last result is going to show that actually that is enough information to support cooperation. Okay, are there any uh, questions before I move on to this last set of results? Yeah, Emin? I, I believe your first example kind of answered my question. So your partner's last K actions example. Mm -hmm. So that's roughly speaking similar to what I had in mind when I said limited memory. Uh, I see. I see. Okay. Um, well, right, so, so to clarify, um, uh, so this is saying that our negative result extends you allow a little extra information. Um, another thing I thought you might have been asking was, uh, does our positive result extend if you only have that yeah. information? Yeah. So, uh, yep. Okay. Okay, so again, the last thing we're going to do is investigate the consequences of letting players communicate freely with their current partner by cheap talk before taking action. Okay, now note that the model is not yet fully specified because I haven't told you uh, how bad types communicate. Right? Rational types are going to communicate strategically. What messages do bad types? So there are different reasonable things one could assume here. Um, if I want to make my life very easy, I could assume that bad types are willing to cooperate in any way, and the equilibrium designer could freely specify how bad types communicate. If I want to make my life very hard, I could assume that uh, bad types are actually malevolent and just want to try to mess up cooperation among rational types and, and send messages to try to hinder cooperation by rational types. Uh, what we actually do is instead adopt an intermediate assumption, which is that bad types have the same payoff functions as good types, 
and like good types communicate strategically so as to maximize their own. Again, the interpretation is that bad types are similar to rational types, except that they um, are just forced to always defect rather than possibly take other actions. Uh, so, oops, sorry. I um, forgot to mute my phone. I apologize. Um, so, in other words, we're viewing bad types here as rational, relentless defectors rather than as malevolent types who try to minimize other players. Okay, so recall that uh, I argued that for any form of within match communication, cooperation is impossible if one is of the login goes in. In contrast, uh, our last result shows that with uh, within match cheap talk communication, a folk theorem holds whenever one minus of the login goes to zero. This is a much more principled result than the one that we uh, obtained by using uh, bilateral incentives without cheap talk. Right, you know, this condition holds as long as the you know, population size is not exponentially large relative to uh, the discount rate, you know, the discount rate between interactions. Okay, so in proving this result, there are two main issues that have to be addressed. So, okay, so let me say, so in, in, intuitively what's going on here is that um, if whenever I defect against anybody, you know, word that I'm a bad guy spreads exponentially through the population and sort of at exponential speed, people stop cooperating with me. That's gonna be enough to determine my defection exactly when one minus the login is small. So there are two steps we have to take care of to go from that intuition to an actual uh, theorem that cooperation can be supported in equilibrium. So first there's a purely probabilistic result which is we have to show that uh, when players do share information truthfully, it indeed spreads exponentially through the population, right? It, intuitively, information should spread, you know, like a logistic curve through the population. But of course, you know, we, we have a discrete uh, population, discrete time random matching model. We have to check that indeed with high probability that is how information spreads. So of course, like that, you know, information doesn't always spread exponentially. There, you know, it could be that, you know, I cheat you in period one, and then uh, I just get really lucky, and you keep matching with the same person forever after that, or for you know, a million years after that. So, so the fact that I was a bad guy, he doesn't spread very far. You know, that could happen, but you see that happens with low probability. Okay, and then finally, there's a game theoretic problem, which is that we have to actually construct a, a true sequential equilibrium given the possibility of various problematic low probability events. So again, as that information usually spreads uh, exponentially, but you know, it could be that the uh, matching worked out in some unlikely way so the information didn't spread. When I'm making my decisions what to do, I need to take into account that there's some chance that information didn't spread as I thought it would, uh, and, and so on. Moreover, another problem is that uh, with high, if each player is bad with probability epsilon, with high probability, the fraction of bad players in the population is close to epsilon. But uh, with low probability, the fraction of bad types in the population could be very different from epsilon. And I need to take that into account also that it could be that actually there are you know, many fewer rational types in the population than I uh, first. Okay, so this has been a long talk. I've covered a lot of results. Um, in the interest of time, uh, rather than showing you formal uh, results and proofs, I'm just going to describe how we address these two issues. Okay, so here's a, a formal lemma that uh, formalizes the idea that information spreads exponentially uh, in this random matching. Okay, so let's consider a uniform random matching among n agents. This is you see this limit stated in a bit more generally than the thing about prisoners. Let me just consider any random matching process where we have n players who meet uniformly random each period. Suppose in period one, some player, say agent one, knows some rumor, some piece of information. And in every period, all agents other than agent two who know the rumor share it with their partners. Meanwhile, agent two never shares the rumor. This, this is going to be relevant for our uh, proof because imagine the rumors that agent two is a bad guy. Then agent two is not going to want to share this information, but everyone else is, is willing to share it. 
Okay, so then the result is that uh, with high probability in, uh, um, you know, with high probability everyone's going to become in, informed uh, in a time frame that, you know, in, in a time frame that's uh, uh, linear in the log of the population size. So more precisely, uh, let's let t equals z log n. So each time we increase z by, each time we increase z by one, we've increased uh, t, the amount of time we've been communicating by log n. So then there are constants c and z bar, which don't depend on n, such that whenever z is greater than z bar, so we've been communicating for a large number of log n chunks of time, the probability that everyone that everyone is now informed of the rumor at time t uh, is um, one minus exponential of z. So each time we add an extra log n periods to talk, uh, the probability that we uh, haven't yet all been informed of the rumor declines exponentially. So again, you, you know, this would be true if you had a continuum population and uh, uh, you know, information literally just spread according to the logistic curve. But this says something similar happens in this discrete model. Uh, in fact, uh, some probabilists proved a similar result in the 80s, where rather than a random uh, pairwise exchange of information, they had a model where each informed player, each period, randomly kind of messages a, a, a receiver. So if you're informed, you pick someone random and inform them, but you don't have sort of random meetings in exchange. So our results are slightly different, but similar basic idea. The basic idea is, is, is roughly that as long as most players are uninformed, uh, informed players are very likely to meet uninformed players, so the number of informed players increases exponentially. And once most players are informed, uh, then uh, again, informed players are very likely to meet uninformed players, and the number of uninformed players then uh, decreases exponentially. So this is the basic. Uh, uh, Alex? Yeah? So in the statement of this MI, would you mind reminding me what's the role of this agent 2, who never shares the room? There's no role of the agent 2, it's just that we kind of, um, uh, uh, it, it's, like the lemma would be true without this agent two also, but we, we want this agent two there because when we apply this, when, when we think about applying this lemma to show that, uh, you know, this thread of blacklisting is going to make you want to cooperate, we need to take into account the fact that you yourself are not going to be incentivized to share the information that you're, that you defend. Mm -hmm. So in other words, like when, when we apply this to our game, uh, there's always going to be, uh, for each piece of information that is, uh, um, for example, whether a given player is should be trusted or not, that player herself is going to not want to spread this rumor. So we need to okay. check the other players for clearing the rumors. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So given this lemma. It's easy to support cooperation as an approximate Nash equilibrium. And we can use just simply these strategies I've been uh, hinting at so far. Each player carries in her head a blacklist of opponents. Uh, when players meet, uh, they tell each other uh, which third parties they've blacklisted, and they add them to each of their respective lists. So maybe when I meet Arda, I say, Arda, don't trust players 8, 10, and 12, and you tell me, Alex, don't trust players 17, 19, 21, and then we each kind of listen to each other and add those players to the list of people who we're not going to cooperate with. Then I cooperate with you if and only if you're not on my blacklist, and if you defect against me, I blacklist. I, I do my best. And it's, it's not hard to show, given the previous lemma, that, um, you know, as long as one minus delta log n is small, this is going to support, an, this such strategies are going to be an approximate initial equilibrium and players are going to cooperate. So again, what's kind of on path here is that the rational types are uh, always in cooperate with other rational types. When a rational type meets a bad type, uh, the rational type uh, is going to defect uh, if she already knows this guy's, uh, if she's already been told that this guy should be blacklisted, otherwise she'll cooperate, but then she'll blacklist him. And so, you know, in the early part, or in the early part of play, 
when rational types and bad types meet, sometimes the bad types, sometimes the rational type will cooperate with the bad type defects. But before too long, you know, the rational types blacklist will consist exactly of those types who are truly bad, and we're going to have cooperation among rational types and defection between rational types. Because that's all very nice, seems very reasonable uh, description of how cooperation could work in a group. Uh, unfortunately, this very simple strategy approval is not an exact notion of equilibrium because it doesn't uh, take into account various low probability events that could make players uh, not want to follow these strategies. So for example, suppose it turns out that everyone except players one and two are bad. We just got very unlucky and actually almost everyone in the group turned out to be a bad guy. So then uh, if players one and two learn this, they, they learn that everyone is blacklisted except uh, the other member of this pair, then when they match each other, even if they think that each other are, is good, they shouldn't cooperate. Because remember, we've assumed that 1 minus delta n is uh, quite high. You know, they, they, 1 and 2 meet each other only very infrequently. So once, the, if they happen to learn that everyone else is bad, they then shouldn't cooperate with each other. But of course, we, we're assuming, I mean, the, the whole point here is we're assuming that players are too impatient to support cooperation via only bilateral incentives. You're only going to cooperate because the threat of you know, multilateral punishment. So if you learn that most of these people are actually bad guys, there's always defecting, you know, there's, you, you can't be incentivized to cooperate. So your very first thought might be that, well, it doesn't sound like that big a problem. Maybe we just have players cooperate unless they learn there are very few rational types. And in that, and if we learn that we happen to have gotten very unlucky, and we're a bad population today, only then do we not cooperate. But that's not going to work because, you know, once players stop cooperating when there are very few rational types, there's a serious problem of unraveling. Uh, what happens, you know, let's say the equilibrium says that we're, we're not going to cooperate if there's fewer than 10% rational types in the population. Well, then once I learn there are 11% bad types in the population, I might be very worried that someone else might have learned there's only 10% rational types and is going to start defecting. So I might want to start defecting now at 11%. Then others are going to start defecting at 12% and, and so on. So uh, it's not an it's not a easy problem to fix. So instead, we need a more complicated construction to prevent this kind of unraveling. So let me just uh, give a, a few of the ideas. So first of all, um, we're going to prescribe that players should cooperate only after they learn through cheap talk that there are enough rational types. So the game's going to start with a kind of trust building phase, if you will. Players are going to defect for a while while they talk about um, uh, uh, sorry, so Okay, so formally, we, in the very first period, rational players are supposed to cooperate. And that kind of establishes the, the information in the system about who is rational. Uh, <clears throat> then players are going to defect for a long time while uh, communicating via uh, cheap talk uh, until they learn there are enough rational types to support cooperation. Okay, but a worry then is that um, you might worry that if, if I don't learn there are enough rational types, I still... Uh, might want to cooperate because otherwise I might be uh, uh, punished if it then turns out that there are a lot of rational types and uh, it, it looks like I'm just um, uh, defecting in a selfish way. So we need to uh, forgive players who defect at histories where uh, they got unlucky and failed to learn there were enough rational types because of some error in the, because the matching, matching process took on some unlikely realization. So we need to, basically, we, we're now going to need to con communicate more information than just whether each player is black or not. We're going to convey information about the details of their histories. And we have to incentivize this communication. So that's going to be done by making third parties indifferent about whether a given player is rewarded or punished. And to formally make this connection go, we, we use so-called uh, a, so a block belief reconstruction, borrowing from this literature on repeating as a private monitoring, including this earlier paper with uh, uh, Joy. Okay, so the big picture is that, um, to some extent, in terms of the sort of basic uh, probability of how fast information can flow and people's basic uh, incentives to cooperate, this blacklisting idea should be enough to support cooperation when 1 minus delta log n is small. To actually turn this into an exact sequential equilibrium, there are some uh, important subtleties that have to be dealt with, and this requires a more complicated.
Okay, this was a lot of information. Let me just give a big picture summary and then there'll be time for questions after. So the theme of today's talk is that introducing simple and realistic forms of incomplete information, for instance, the probability that some players might be bad types who always behave selfishly, dramatically changes our models of cooperation in large groups. Our first theme is that collective punishment completely breaks down. Unlike in the case where everyone's rational, it's not possible to support cooperation via the third of collective punishment where each player might be a bad type. Moreover, even with individual uh, identities being observable and possibly giving individualized incentives, still uh, cooperation is going to fail whenever bilateral interactions are infrequent, unless there's uh, a lot of information in the system, unless there's some way to track each player's individual reputation. However, that requirement is not as onerous as it might first seem. Uh, ordinary conversation, gossiping about the whether other people in society should be trusted as we do every day uh, can provide enough information to support cooperation and can also be incentive. So in the end, we get a, a picture of larger cooperation based on communication and individual uh, rewards and punishments, uh, which we think is a more realistic starting point for investing these issues than the uh, received paradigm of uh, incentives via collective. Okay, thanks, that's all I have. Thanks a lot, Alex. Uh, questions from our panelists? Uh, Aigun, do you? Yes, yeah, okay, first let me uh, unmute myself. So Alex, uh, so, you know, your, um, I mean, your results, your model reminds me of reputation models. And I was trying to kind of think about like, you know, how to map your, uh, your models to, you know, these reputation models. And, uh, you know, suppose there are like, you know, many buyers and many sellers, and they are playing the standard, like, you know, reputation game. Like, you know, you produce either high quality or low quality product. And, you know, the buyers are gonna buy either the high quality or the low quality. And uh, there are some good apples, not bad apples, but good apples, who always produce the high quality. And, and then, you know, your anti-folk theorems are like, aren't they like uh, reputation uh, results? Or what do they, you know, what do they tell in this setup? Like, do they sell something that... Uh, yeah, so uh, great, it's a great question. Um, I think uh, that would be a great thing to think about. I think there's more, I think there's more to be done to figure out the exact connection, but there are some, uh, very significant differences. So for ex in particular, um, the logic of our anti-folk theorem, I think is actually in some sense almost the opposite of the logic of reputation results in the following sense. So think about classical reputation results like uh, Fiedenberg Levine. The basic logic of that result is that, you know, if there's some commitment type that I would like, to, uh, if, if there's some commitment type that um, uh, induces a favorable response by uh, the other players, then they show that I, I can't do much worse than pay off of the commitment type because if I relentlessly play the commitment type strategy, that's going to have to induce a favorable response by other players. Okay. That's the logic of reputation models. If there's some commitment type that, and if, if I play as that type for a long time, eventually other, that's going to have an effect on other people's behavior. The logic of our result is entirely that uh, if there's a lot of uncertainty about how many people are playing some commitment type action, if I also take that action, it can only have a small effect on other people's behavior. So, in some sense, the logic is 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 very different. The logic, right, the logic here is that if there's a lot of uncertainty about how many commitment types there are, if I also throw in my hat as a commitment type, that just statistically can't have a big effect on the population distribution of actions. Whereas, in like in Levine, like. Implicitly, if there were some equilibrium with a rational type and community type played differently, if the rational type started playing as a community type instead, that would have a big effect on the distribution of actions. So, I, I still think there might be some nice connections between these kinds of models that, that could be worked out, but the sort of basic intuition is actually very different. Thanks. 
Lex, can I ask one like quick question about these black lists that mm -hmm. you have? I'm I'm wondering if your results are robust to the following case. Suppose that my list mutates with some small probability. So with tiny probability, somebody drops out you know, of this list or somebody enters into this list every period. Uh, do you think it's gonna change the results that much? Or I mean, you can interpret them also like mistakes in communication maybe. Right. Yeah, I think mistakes in communication is, is very interesting actually. Um, you know, my intuition is that, uh, you know, depending on how you model it, these sort of like simple blacklisting strategies that give an approximate equilibrium might, uh, yeah, might not survive so well, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. intuition. But, you know, in a more sophisticated e equilibrium, you can imagine trying to, you could address that, right? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. So for example, in our, to construct an exact sequential equilibrium, we have to do things, uh, you know, like, uh, more like review strategies. So uh, since matching is random, there's always some chance that, uh, you know, matching is, takes on some unlikely realization where some message doesn't get sent. So to make that probably very small, we have to have sort of long periods of communication. And so if you have errors in communication, you can imagine that if we, like, repeat the message, we could make it extremely unlikely, you know, arbitrarily unlikely that there's some error. So um, that would be my, my intuition. I mean, so, so I guess my short answer is that my feeling is that our equilibrium constructions, maybe both of them would have to be modified, but I think that, you know, that could be taken into account. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, maybe one. So Alex, this could be, <laughs> This could be an ignorant question because I don't know uh, the literature uh, in great detail, but I was I was just wondering, you know, in many real life, real life instances, uh, if you have such a blacklist, then one thing you do is, well, you don't interact with these guys. So my question is basically, how crucial is the random matching assumption for the tractability of these models? Could you have a model where uh, if I'm the good guy and this is the non-anonymous version, I see that I'm matched with a black guy, maybe by paying some cost or something, I choose not to interact with this guy. I want a new right, match. Right, right, right. Okay, so, you know, in our model like this, um, you know, what, what would happen when you, when you meet with a blacklisted person is you, you both defect. So it's a little, you know, that's, already a little bit like not interacting, right? I mean, it's, you know, we, hmm. um, but, but more generally, I think it's a very good question. Like the reason why we focus on uh, random matching rather than some uh, more richly structured model, like something with some kind of assortativity or some kind of uh, you know, voluntary matching or separation is really just because we think this is the simplest, most canonical starting point. Nice. It's not that we're this, so, um, and actually in the paper we mentioned that as, as something that seems to us like a very natural direction for, for future work, you know, how does introducing equal information affect community enforcement with a richer uh, population structure? I think that's a very good question. Okay. Um, okay, I think we are running out of time already. Alex, thank you very much for this presentation. You're definitely on our whitelist. Uh, for the rest of us. <laughs> so, uh, uh, thanks a lot for this. Uh, just kidding. I, I, I really appreciate you uh, giving okay. it. Uh, all right, and thanks to all of our participants. We hope to see you in our future seminars as well. Okay, thank you very much. This is uh, very nice. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Good thanks. evening thanks. or yeah. good afternoon. Yeah, thanks, <laughs> Alex. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.